Yeah, good morning, everyone. And once again, thank you, Rahul, for this conference and having me here do a couple of these sessions. What I'm going to do uh, for this morning's uh, panel discussion is take you through a series of works. Uh, yeah, some lights behind are fine, otherwise it's too dark. And it's not too striking. Yeah, I think it's fine to have this light. Thank you. I think a lot of things that I was trying to talk about or discuss uh, last evening, one may see where some of those arguments or some of those samples that were probably running in my head when I was writing the ideas, they came from a couple of the works that I will be showing today. Um, there are three sort of avatars or three kinds of work that I will focus on. One is I'm going to look at uh, Domus. I've had three editorial stints of which I think Domus has been, yes, Domus has been the longest. Uh, I worked for the Council of Architecture magazine years ago. Um, and one of the interesting things about the Council of Architecture magazine was because they didn't want to get into issues with different architects, Mera Project, Mera Project, Doska Project, Council Members Ka Project, they had a policy of no project presentation. So as an editor, you had to run for essays. You had to run for more kind of theory pieces, which everybody cribbed about, but I saw that as an advantage because I said, that's the only way that you will get writing done. And one was also clear not to stick to, very often we fall in these fashionable areas. Like today, I normally keep saying conservation and sustainability are most fashionable. They are the safest areas to talk about if you don't talk of the politics behind it. And you still are a very nice person if you talk about heritage, and sustainability. So everybody wants to write on write on that. But to sort of tease out other areas, tease out other essays. Uh, and I think that was also, uh, and besides my own interests in the, in the sphere of art in Bombay, also the art spectrum is, I'm quite involved in it. But to get people from history, to get people from art, to get people from design, writing in the architecture magazine was indeed a very good exercise for me. Then I worked with Indian architect and builder, and then in uh, 2012, it was uh, it was Domus, and we we closed just at the pandemic, and we've not been able to restart. But I think by the time we came to by the time we came to Domus, uh, one had uh, and and all the things that I say here, one has to keep in uh, mind that I have been in education literally since two days before I graduated. So I have been teaching constantly, and I think the the academy, which I'm not going to talk about today, because it in that sense doesn't fall in the parenthesis of the uh, of the topic this morning. But I think the academy has been a constant space of thinking and exploration. One has constantly taken research projects. Uh, one has constantly taken ideas from from say exhibitions or magazines into the teaching space got a sense of feedback, responses, and one has taken that back to the space outside the academy. So in that sense, the academic space has always been a kind of a laboratory uh, uh, for me. I think by the time by the time I came into Domus, I think the sense of the pending contemporary or the sense of what it means to be now uh, was very, very important. I had also gone through my cultural studies uh, kind of education where the sense of the present, the debates between the colonial and the national was sort of the primary ground on which we were thinking of what it means to be a scholar or somebody who makes sense of life as it unfolds around us. And I think in that sense, the magazine literally became this for me. It was like a cabinet of ideas and arguments that month after month, you just logged. It was like, you know, you travel and you have the showcase in your house where you keep putting things every time you travel. The magazine was that for me. Every month, something went in that showcase and one, one day, you know, you just look at that showcase and you start making connections between different things you see in your house cabinet. The magazine was that. And in that sense, uh, you, you, do have, uh, you do have a clear editorial sense of what you expect, but it also allowed for a set of voices uh, to, to come into the magazine. Obviously, obviously, voices are allowed through an editorial filter, no doubt about that. But it was, it was in that sense, a variety of things that could sort of come into the come into the magazine. And I think in, in that sense, the magazine or, or an editorial effort for a profession should be precisely this, the possibility of how you keep expanding imagination, 
that you that that the profession always needs these either forums like this or you need something like a publication or a range of books which keep bringing the profession back to its conversations and i think with the state of architecture i have to say even if it means crediting ourselves as me and rahul and ranjit that a couple of architects in the last week in bombay said you know can we salvage a part of this exhibition and not let it go down on the last day of the three month long period because it's something that we have come to again and again in the last three months and many architects in the city at least made that effort to visit the exhibition again and again so in a sense the the, the profession also needs this sort of mirroring feedback feedback space and and in that sense it was if if we understand the contemporary we have i think all spoken about it but one has to also lay down as i said yesterday the protocols of how do you do it that that the 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 session that is probably going to discuss as we discuss as we spoke yesterday the mainstream and what becomes the non mainstream but the the ground of what it means to be an architect or an architecture practice itself needs to sort of go through this questions of where do i grow where do i sort of pull in which are the going to be the areas that you link with everybody talks of multidisciplinary and collaboration but what is multidisciplinary and collaboration how does it unfold in practice how does it unfold in intellectual kind of life both ways one has to one has to talk about it and and a platform like 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 a magazine a journal a conference allows one to reflect on that in a much more much more focused way and then the then the 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 challenge and the responsibility is to sort of what are the questions so if you're saying the profession has to think critically it becomes your responsibility as a journal or a platform or even running a one week long kalagora arts festival for architecture and urban design who are you inviting what are you asking them to speak what are they speaking and what sense is everyone making of what everyone is speaking so it is a it is a challenge and a responsibility to to sort of identify the questions they can be challenged by the profession they can be discussed by the profession but you have to stick your neck out and say these are the questions that we need to talk or ask and that becomes then this sort of series of collective voices debates and argumentations that as much as one had an editorial kind of a view or a structure the editorial view and structure had to also be generous in a certain way to have multiple voices sort of float in and out of it constantly and i think you know sometimes the cover is a challenge i think i have i have had a wonderful publisher who's also a dear friend now after all these years of uh, years of working one thing he came in always was the cover like all publishers would do and i can i can i'll share a quick joke one he said kaivan what is this brick every time is that what is good architecture and it reminds me to stories about sept and early young students and parents visiting sept and brick buildings and all of that and you have to that makes you think sometimes saying yeah what is this obsession yaar aur to kuch hoga but you know this is uh, this is a uh, 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 biennale uh, pavilion that was on the kumbh kum mela but to sort of have uh, have works of art or have pavilions etc on the cover were also very important decisions at times because the cover is an important space it is not just an important space because somebody will pick up your magazine on the shelf or advertisers will love it because both these we thankfully really did not bother much much about so one could sort of play with the cover also to sort of ask some of these questions as to what we were what we were looking at yeah and as and i think in in all of these things that i have been saying i think attention and thoughtfulness i think that was something with with a monthly rush that one had to sort of produce a magazine in which is beautiful because even as you it forces you to write at least 2000 words every month and edit about 7 8000 words every month and that is 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 very very important also because it allows you the space for taking forward that into your classroom as i said but also discussions with colleagues all the all the time but in all this rush the attention and thoughtfulness cannot be cannot be lost and then it comes to this classic question that i sort of raised yesterday that in all of this one is keeping this benchmark constant that the that the everyday and the contemporary have to be in this constant questioning and have to be in this constant production 
and somewhere you are setting this kind of a uh, lens of judging it. Yes, you have to be in a position of judging it and sort of participating in its thoughtful and critical production. I'll move into uh, the, the, the other two roles that I'm looking at very quickly. This is not a role that I ever imagined, both these come next two roles. One is the role of being a curator. And actually some of the early days when I got asked if like Kaiwan is a curator and I said, no, 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 I'm not a curator. I'm a researcher and I put up my research work in a three-dimensional space rather than putting it in a paper. That's very, very different. And the other avatar is what I felt into sort of working on architecture biographies, which by now are around four. And again, that was not something that was a that was a planned thing. But these are the two other two positions I'll very quickly talk about. This is the exhibition. This is the exhibition that I did for uh, did for Bauhaus, hundred years of Bauhaus. This was the largest and the biggest exhibition that happened celebrating hundred years of Bauhaus in Stuttgart in Germany. And that was the same space where they celebrated 50 years of Bauhaus. And this was kind of, this exhibition was very critical of the Bauhaus. And it said 50 years after 50 years of Bauhaus, recalling its own exhibition uh, in, that, in that space. And when the, when the curators invited me, I said, look, now just because you all are celebrating Bauhaus, we don't all have to start in the world dancing around Bauhaus. Okay, so I'm not interested in sort of doing what happened in India with Bauhaus because just four years ago, uh, Bauhaus in Calcutta as an exhibition and a catalog was done. Tapati Guha, Thakurta and all of them were involved, Parthamitar, and they had done a fantastic exhibition. I would just do a repeat or a better repeat, maybe. But I said, let me look at a parallel history that came from English colonialism. And if you had one, because I was also working on ornament in my PhD work, so I said, there's one thesis on ornament that comes from the German tradition. There's one thesis on ornamentation and arts and crafts that comes from the English tradition. Let me do this contrast. And that's where this exhibition, the curators are also very charged uh, and, and thinking intellectuals. They allowed me this space. And in this very small cabinet kind of a kind of a room, I opened up the history of the JJ College of Architecture, the Baudaji Lard Museum, which is the erstwhile Victoria and Albert uh, India or Bombay Museum. I looked at the history of exhibition making right from 1940, uh, sorry, 1851 Crystal Palace to Vistara to kind of uh, the Aditi that happened. Um, so I looked at uh, I looked at about seven, eight themes in this very quick, very quick space. But these were more kind of visual memory connectors. And to, and to also then get into this question, two things. One is, what is India's design history? And my thesis, very strongly, this is not the space to argue, but you can argue with me later. Design begins with 1851 in India. You can go to Harappa civilization, look at a pot and say, this is also design. That's a fair enough argument. But in the way I structure it, 1851 is what one would see as design history in India. And this question is very important. How does design tell us something about India, which is also what I was hinting on yesterday. All this has somewhere happened after Alice in Bhuleshwar, which was an early preoccupation with the city, as just as I keep saying, calibrating the contemporary in terms of architecture. I think the 1980s and 1990s threw us in a certain kind of an urban imagination and an urban everyday experience. And actually, it was looking at these sort of details of design, as you can see from some of the pages of this magazine, uh, sorry, of this book, that took me to some of the questions that I'm talking of in Domus or in 100 Years of Bauhaus. And the, and the more concentrated uh, biographical work happened with this question of if I would do a work on, yes, if I would do a book on Kadri, I am Kadri. Uh, and I think with an interest in architecture history and interest in ornamentation, it also became this thing as to why certain people had been left out of this mainstream writing of history of architecture. And I think Kadri was a real kind of an exploration uh, exploration for, for myself and into many questions of how we would rewrite, rewrite history and what why a certain uh, ideological approach to visual language or beauty would keep a person like Kadri out of the books of history of architecture. The other exhibition I did in detail was 30 years of Rahul Mehrotra and Associate uh, Architects which was a completely different exploration of, again, what I, what I did with Alice in Bulesh were looking at Bombay and then expanding that to looking at India. I think Rahul Mehrotra's work 
became that kind of an exploration, but in a very pertinent kind of architectural uh, exploration. And this also meant looking at the studio space of the architect, looking at the exhibition space for architecture. How do you write a chronology? How do you write a history? How do you look at the materiality of building or putting design together? I think this exhibition allowed us to, including curator getting into a drawing exercise himself. And this is a this is a book I'm working on, but I did an initial exhibition because it was to mark the first year memorial of the death of this architect. But this architect is again a kind of parallel for me for Kadri, which is Jitendra Mistri from, from Ahmedabad, somebody who entered into sort of architecture revival. Uh, architecture revival, working with uh, historical architecture. He's the one who's worked a lot with the Udaipur uh, palace renovation and converting it into a hotel began as a high modernist and then shifted to sort of retrieving broken havelis and reconstructing them and working with craft in a sense that his studio is actually half architecture studio and a huge craft uh, a workshop that is parallel in that space. So this exhibition was done in the office. This is his office, which I converted into an exhibition space. And this is the workshop that is running, that is in that same campus where you have from metalwork, woodwork, all of that. And I'll just close with two slides going back to the city question. But again, the city question was explored through very, very architectural uh, spaces, which was the Shifting City exhibition we did with the Goethe Institute, the Max Miller Bhavan. This was the Venice Biennale for the Germany Pavilion that looked at arrival city after the Syrian migrations in Europe. And they asked eight other cities in the world that have migration to reinterpret Arrival City. And in that reinterpretation of looking at Bombay, we moved the title from Arrival City to Shifting City. At the end of the day, we are all living on the edge. And our job is to constantly make sense of that living on the edge. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you very much, Raulji, for inviting me for this conference. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on a couple of things uh, regarding how I'm involved in the museum and archive and curation. And I'll talk about Karl Pusha's building, which you are actually seeing at the moment, uh, and uh, what sort of exhibitions we are doing, how we are doing it. Uh, the publications that we are doing through the foundation, how the foundation is actually, you know, looking after the building and the other activities that happens around it. So this image is, is a very iconic image for me, which is, you know, which was created by Karl Pusha, designed by Karl Pusha in the 70s. And it was initially designed as a hostel for foreign visitors to promote tourism in the 70s. And... Uh, once, once it's at, it was operating as a, as a hostel, then later on, you know, around 2000 to 2010, it became almost like a dead space. And when, while it was a dead space, this space was like this. And at that time, the Seraph Foundation actually came into the picture and decided to convert this space into a documentation center. And at that time, we didn't know how this documentation center was going to work. So because the building was actually designed by Karl Pusha and he was engaged with the foreign expatriate community at that time, and he worked with lots of artists and architects during that process. So we decided to collect their materials and bring it to this building and create a documentation center. So Taragong Museum was all about the research and documentation that is done by the foreign scholars after 1950s when Nepal was open to the rest of the world. So recently, last year in 2022, uh, 2022 we converted, we rebranded the Taragao Museum into Taragao Next. So what is Taragao Next? The next component is a very futuristic component. 
And we're thinking, you know, previously we were only talking about the museum itself, but now we wanted to talk about the building. We wanted to talk about the green space we have. We wanted to talk about that, the amphitheater. You know, all those components we wanted to kind of talk about, but that also kind of the next component also indicates what is next for art, what is next for architecture, what is next for sustainability, you know? And that was very important for us. So rather than, you know, making it just a museum, we wanted to kind of expand that idea and create a space where people can come and engage for various purposes. And that's how the Tarragon Next actually was invented. So when we talked about Tarragon Next, we talked about three different components, urbanization, community, and culture. We, we deliberately kind of did not want to include art, architecture, or culture, because we wanted to kind of more expand it, you know? And it is working perfectly for us, for our collection, for the building, and for the space we have, because it was so important for us to, you know, connect with the community, connect with the people who are involved into our culture, and so on. Just wanted to kind of touch upon a few of the features that we have within Tarago Museum. I think uh, the building itself is so powerful when Karl Pusha designed it. I don't think he has mentioned anywhere uh, about these features, but it's very interesting to see how these amphitheaters were created, how these steps from the traditional architecture match with the contemporary architecture. Similarly, he was he invented the amphitheater in between spaces of these you know seven cluster of buildings, and it matches with the open spaces that is within the Darbar Square and Baha and Bahis, you know. And this is my favorite one: how he has actually created a water spout, and he used this as a drainage uh, within the building. So these are these are quite an interesting features. How you know architect can reinvent the traditional elements into and, and bring it into within architecture. When we talk about the museum itself and the collection itself, initially, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it was, it was more like a documentation museum. So we're collecting lots of materials from different individuals who came to Nepal and then you know, researched Nepal like nobody else. Even now, you know, if you have to learn or read anything about, about Nepal, we have to take out books that is really written by foreign scholars. You, could, you don't find many books that is written in Nepali. And most of the students and architectural students and art universities, they actually rely upon those uh, uh, documentation. And all these documentations, it has become a repository, but also it has become an exhibition space within Taragao Museum. This is, this is our new exhibition. We actually uh, started uh, just at the beginning of this uh, year. And this exhibition is quite different from what we did in the past. Initially, what was happening is when I was working with Niels Gutzer, who is also one of the, you know, heart and soul of Tarago Museum. He's a German historian who lived in Kathmandu for almost 60 years. And we are following his ideas and following his vision. And then at one point, what we realized was, you know, there was so much happening within the museum space. There was so much text that we're talking about, Nepali heritage, culture, and tradition. But for local people, it was not making any sense. It was just flying over the head. So we wanted to kind of simplify the whole collection and narrate it in a completely different way. So we talk about service in the museum at the moment. We talk about vernacular architecture with, at the moment. We talk about temples, courtyards, and open spaces, you know? And all these, uh, all these documentation, all these materials that is created by different scholars over the period of last 50, 60 years, you can actually see it in the Tarago Museum. And these, these are so important for the Nepali art community that they have actually never seen these documentations ever. You know, they have read in the books, they, have, they probably know some of the scholars they are involved into the museum, but never they have never seen it. So this exhibition is actually, you know, since we have launched this exhibition, we had got a great football. People are actually very passionate about the collection and what we do within the museum space. So the museum space is not only the exhibition space, it is a multi-layered space. We want to talk about architecture, we want to talk about collection, we want to talk about engagement, education, all those factors. And that is all happening because of the building itself. 
I think the Carl Pusha's building is so powerful. Most of the time I was looking for Mona Lisa within my you know, collection, but there was no Mona Lisa within the collection, but the building itself is a Mona Lisa. And I think that is one of the key reason why people come to Tarragon Museum and they engage in different levels. So, you know, I, I do a, do an architectural tour as well, like the, one of the image, which is I'm, I'm with the university students and talk about, you know, the architecture, how it is making difference for us to be within that space and have a museum within that space. So this is similarly like, it's a, it's a very active space. We do all sort of programs. There's a, you know, the theatrical programs happening. There's children's art competition happening. There's, you know, lecture program happening. All these activities are so much required uh, to, to be a part of the museum and that space. And similarly, Kathmandu Trinale is one of the events that happens every you know, three years within the space. And we become uh, you know, a part of that community where the architecture plays a very, very strong role. Going back to the Nepal Architecture Archive, Nepal Architecture Archive is something we started uh, around 2016. And uh, when we started the museum at 2014, we, had, we started the museum with around 150, 200 materials. But over the period of time, the, that collection has grown so much. We have got over 100,000 materials within the archive. And it is all about Nepali architectural history, Nepali tradition, culture, and other things. And the most interesting part is, you know, everything is anchoring it with the architecture. You know, the architecture is the main focal point, but what is happening is with the architectural material, there are lots of photographs, slides, videos, manuscripts, drawings, books, so many research papers that is coming to the archive, right? So obviously it's, even though it's an architectural archive, there's so many multiple materials that we have within the space that, uh, you know, people can actually utilize that in a completely different way. So this is the this is the same space uh, within within the architecture archive. It's not actually accessible to the public at the moment, but we have lots of materials, and we allow people on request basis. We talk about documentation. Documentation has been one of the key uh, part of the foundation and the museum itself and the archive. And we run several documentation projects, you know, outside the Kathmandu Valley, and we document different uh, vernacular spaces and those spaces. You know, we send university professors and students, they go and do the vernacular studies and bring that material to the archive. Nepal Heritage Documentation Project is one of the key projects for us, which is running from last five years. It's gonna, uh, we, we, we're gonna work with them for another three years. And it is, it is documenting all the Nepali heritage and cultural sites. Uh, publication has been a very important part for the Nepal Architecture Archive and the foundation because every year what we do is we publish a book from foreign scholars who have worked and lived in Nepal and have documented Nepal like nobody else did. So we, we connect with these individuals and then we do the publication uh, for, for them. And that is, again, it's, it's a part of the documentation, documentation for, the, for the archive. And uh, we conduct another program called Paragon Lecture Series, which is basically, it happens every year. We invite scholars from different parts of the world who, may, who have worked in Nepal, and they bring their materials to Kathmandu, and we exhibit them, we host them, and that collection will become the part of the uh, Nepal Architecture Archive. And if there is a publication uh, you know, component, then we also publish the book for them as well. So the, this is, again, it's a, it's a part of the book lunch program that happens within the Tarragao Museum. The building itself is, you know, like even though we talk about lots of documentation, architecture, archive, it has, again, become a very cultural space as well. So this space is very much used by different communities in Nepal, you know, in, especially in the Kathmandu Valleys and all sort of cultural you know, programs that will that happens within the within the museum space. And lastly, I didn't talk about this, but it talks about, you know, the foundation looks after this another space called Sagarmatha Next, which is the part of the foundation. It's another project that happens on the foothill of Mount Everest, 3,775 meters high. We have created another space called Sagarmatha Next. And this space is 
this particular building is actually designed by a uh, Dutch architect, Anna Finster. And, and this space is all about, you know, we talked about climate yesterday. This is about climate, sustainability, environment. And we invite artists, you know, scholars, um, designers to come and do residency within the space. And they come and work here and then they, they do an exhibition. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing space that runs under the foundation. And this is this is the space which uh, it's it's again it's a very similar space like Tarago Museum. It's a cluster of a uh, couple of buildings, and everything there is actually anchoring around waste. Sagamatha is reason is one of the most polluted space, you know, Himalayan space. And what we do is we collect those waste, bring it to the center, convert that into art, product, and design, and we connect with scholars, individuals you know, artists, writer, all sort of people. Thank you so much. And also use this, right, for the question? Okay, okay. Uh, good morning. Um, I wonder if you can see me, actually. Oh, <laughs> uh, Please don't fall. <laughs> uh, better? Yes. <laughs> right. Um, good morning. Um, I thank the organi organizers for giving me this opportunity, and thank you, Rahul, in particular. Um, I'll uh, talk about our practice that derives from the mission and the work of the nonprofit arts organization, the Bengal Foundation. It's based in Dhaka. Um, the foundation's work is transdisciplinary. It's broad and inclusive. Our interests range from art and music to crafts, theater, and architecture. All events and programs of the foundation are free and open to the public. And there's a strong focus on documentation and archiving of culturally and historically relevant material, which is then curated and presented in exhibitions, expositions, and publications. Collecting, documenting, recovery, and renewal is core to our work. The reason we collect, conserve, and archive, facilitate research, and curate exhibitions is because these are different ways to tell stories that encourage examination and inquiry. The stream of researching, shaping, and presenting allows us and the public we serve to interrogate handed down legacies, uh, gain new understandings of our past and hopefully of the present. The quality of research in um, architecture schools and art schools is um, often inadequate. And so the aim is also to address um, education and build a database or archive of critical research topics as a fundamental premise for design thinking. The river realm uh, in the Bengal Delta that makes up the bulk of Bangladesh is a complex ecology of uh, erosion, reformulation, and confluence. We are perhaps perpetually at the edge of the confluence or mohona. In Bengali, the word mohona carries a more beautiful set of meanings than the straight hydrographic fact of being a confluence. It is a merging of flows and the unpredictable productions of new forms and conditions, and often the turning point for new histories. East Bengal, Bangladesh has long been home to grassroots syncretism, which has endured constant threats of reformist aspirations. The cultural substratum is multiform, rich, and diverse. The political history, as we all know, um, has seen much turbulence. Um, the consequence, as a consequence, you know, it brings to the fore many contestations of identity and place. In Bangladesh, our passage from the rural to the urban is quite recent and fast-paced and hence mostly uncontrolled. With a high population, uneven allocations of resources and social asymmetries, upcoming uh, generations are left to struggle with notions of identity, of habit, heritage, authenticity, and hybridity. We believe that the work of the Bengal Foundation and its sister entity, the Bengal Institute for Architectural Landscapes and Settlements, um, through our work, we, we can in some small way help make sense of the circumstances in which we live. A little bit about the 
Bengal Institute uh, for Architecture. Uh, it has an integrated approach to the arrangement and re rearrangement of the lived environment to bring about a new landscape consciousness and use water as the basis for planning. Um, in the Bengal Delta, land is borrowed from water. And responding to this hydrogeographic system, urban growth and an appetite for urban land requires an urban and architectural language that should be a model that provides a new paradigm for the city, landscape, and the community. In this light, research and hydrographic uh, mapping is an important part of the work done by the Geographical Research Unit of the Bengal Institute. The Institute um, has had the opportunity to work in a number of cities in Bangladesh with uh, the river was a principal protagonist in the urban imaginary. The projects demonstrate the possibility of a new language for riverbanks. The Burigonga River bounding Dhaka on the south uh, represented the water dynamic for the city until its deterioration uh, in recent times. For, uh, for an ecological and cultural reinvigoration, uh, of the whole of Dhaka, a radical reclamation of Puriganga River and its banks on both sides is crucial. Invited by the World Bank and the Dhaka South City Corporation in 2016, a conceptual plan was prepared by the Bengal Institute for a new public realm on the Puriganga River. This is just a... Um, the banks of the Shurma River, this is on the northeast of uh, Bangladesh, that glides through Silet City um, are in most cases desolate and barren of public spaces. The Bengal Institute proposed a new ribbon of continuous public space and economic corridors to reinvigorate the banks of the Shurma. In this exhibition, the next Silet exhibition uh, based on re-envisioning the city, uh, in, in addition to the usual drawings and presentations, and one of the ways in which the public was drawn into the con conversation on river revitalization was the long spine, as you can see, of a collection of uh, water samples from dozens of rivers in Silet. So although the riverbank projects are in various stages, some frozen as proposals, some in the design development phase, it can safely be said that by advocating for alternative riverbank cultures, riverbank development itself has become a part uh, of the discourse in government circle, circles. Um, the Bengal Stream Exhibition, it's um, created by the Swiss uh, Architecture Museum in Basel, Switzerland, and the Bengal Institute. Um, the show documented and um, the dynamism and innovation of contemporary architecture in Bangladesh and resulted in a beautiful volume going by the same title um, and uh, comprising original drawings, models, photographs, and other documents of architecture. The show was brought to Dhaka very recently after a successful tour in Europe. Um, through international symposiums, public talks, exhibitions, and workshops, the Institute has invited many thinkers and practitioners to Bangladesh to share their ideas and exchange views with architects and students. Uh, one's in, uh, recently concluded in Beijing, as you can see, this was in 2015, et cetera. So if you're asking uh, how much impact the Institute has had, uh, well, it, that will require a little more time. Um, but perhaps it's safe to say that uh, the Institute has generated a new consciousness of the criticality of the larger scale. That is, it conditions at the scale of the city, settlement, landscape, and region. Uh, we have campaigned for architecture beyond the notion of a singular one-off building and towards the thinking of integration. Uh, the ongoing and future challenges will be large scale, the planning of cities and settlements, the rearrangement of the landscape, and the design of our collective habitats. As for Bengal Foundation, which has been around for about 35 years, it's, it is important for us to, in equal measure to remain consistent and be a dependable arts delivery organization while continuously innovating and evolving. So in order to encourage the public to perceive the arts in new ways, we have often altered languages and locations and adopted unique skills of presentation and production. Progress for us has meant more connections longer relationships, watching others borrow and build on ideas and processes that we may have launched, and most importantly, listening more. We believe that it has been possible to uh, make small but meaningful shifts in how contemporary culture in Bangladesh understands itself. And uh, in that context, I will talk about the Bengal Classical Music Festival, 
uh, it's an interesting model. We have been pursuing the revival of classical music uh, in Bangladesh for decades. But in 2012, we thought of completely rearranging the way such music is usually brought to the public. So the uh, classical music festivals uh, had uh, unprecedented success with audience numbers exceeding 30,000 each night, but a very attentive audience. It was, of course, free and open for the public. Um, and involving some of the finest names in Indian classical music, it has had far-reaching consequences in the cultural milieu of Bangladesh. Uh, and that is owed not only to its ambitious programming, but most importantly to the unconventional spatial arrangements that allowed it to be a fully public-facing program. A little bit more about the festival. Um, pedagogy and the ways in which knowledge is produced in the arts is of interest to us. In 2014, we pub, uh, established the Parampara Sangeeta Lai for imparting free lessons in, in classical music. Um, a few. In terms of art pedagogy, uh, we have um, exhibitions such as the one that's um, by Dali Al Mamun. So he, he's in, he has been investigating colonial history and subsequent knowledge production for a long time. And in this recent exhibition, uh, it's complex and layered. And we feel that uh, these exhibitions lead us to question the extent to which our system of pedagogy and the language of art practice is connected to our history and lived context. The artist SM Sultan, whose birth centenary is being celebrated this year, is important for us. He's unique in favoring local knowledge and resources over conventional means used to fashion his own canvas, uh, make his own pigments. So it presents a crucial discourse in regional specialization and alternative practice. That's the Sultan exhibition and the conservation lab. The Bengal Shilpala is the heart of our activities and uh, houses programs run by the foundation, bookstore, reading area, spaces for concerts, etc. art conservation lab. So there's a small one minute um, video before I go there, um, the slide. Zubair Hassan, whose work is being exhibited in this uh, in this exhibition outside. So the continuity of material in floor, wall, and roof reflects the age-old practice of using a single material, mostly mud, in vernacular architecture. So here's the video. That's Dhaka for you. That's the bookstore. This is a current exhibition that's going on now. That's Tagore, of course. Um, I'll end with, um, uh, we owe our understanding of modern architecture in Bangladesh to the modernist Furana uh, Mazharul Islam, whose birth centenary is being celebrated this year. And I quote Kazi Khalid Ashraf on this, to Mazharul Islam, modern architecture was more than an aesthetic trope of the foreign and the new. It was the most viable instrument to bring about a radical humanist society in the aftermath of colonial disruption. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rahul. And uh, thank you for the entire team for inviting me uh, for this talk today. It is indeed... Um, something uh, very important uh, to discuss these variables and uh, these different types of people, actors who are working in the cultural space. 
an architectural space. Um, uh, it was particularly very good for me because uh, in all the work that I was doing, I was able to take some time to reflect on the work we were uh, producing at uh, the Bainil. The Lahore Biennale um, has in, um, inspired to engage, aspire to engage with the public and work in the public space using a uh, local vernacular lens. The Lahore Biennale Foundation has attempted to approach its projects and goals through alternative strategies formed by inclusivity, context-driven knowledge, and um, and counter tradition forms of critique and prevailing frameworks of curating, researching, and archiving material culture, built ecologies and histories, investing in lived collective experiences, which is already there before. Uh, it's too late that one has to document them for uh, posterity. I think uh, before we talk about the work that we do, it's important to actually uh, look at the city. Uh, which is our main uh, focus. If you can move to the next uh, slide, thank you. There is no place like Lahore. Wherever you go, the history of the city is visible, mostly poetic love, and in some cases, violent ownership in ways of embedded histories of being conquered, ruled over, and multiple bouts of dictatorship. Uh, no wonder it is the birthplace of various significant social and artistic movements and shifts and has seen the face of resistance and it has been a steadfast protagonist. Historically, Lahore has seen been the culture of art cap capital, art, culture, and literature. Uh, the next slide, please. Over the years, especially, um, I actually can't see them. So can I stop share? So I can see which slide is on. Thank you. Over the years, especially since the last few decades, Lahore and its Sufi spirit is a direct dichotomy between the people who govern it and the people who live in it. There is an effect. There's an active effort to turn it into a version of modernity, show a sense of economic growth, even if it is imported. But the city and its citizens have been resisting, demonstrating that they do not oppose change but are against the fast manufacture change without due process. All they want is development through organic growth. Um, I think if we go to the one before uh, at this time, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so why LBF? In 2000s, Pakistan has seen an unprecedented time, change regard to its security, learning from others, it too started to close the city on its citizens through physical obstructions and advanced methods of policing. This was an exceptionally significant moment for all of us. Once open and hospitable, the city was gasping for air and everyone who could was engaged in trying to make sense of what the future may hold. The Lahore Biennale Foundation was formed as a direct response of, the group, of a group of friends uh, with a shared vision to take ownership of the narrative that means uh, uh, by means of creative collaborative mobility, uh, critical thinking, and by bringing art into public spaces through inclusivity, collaboration, public facing programs. As a contemporary arts foundation, LBF works with contemporary and immediate issues. Uh, formed in 2014, one of our, its immediate challenges was to understand the publics that it is formed um, its audience and how to connect with them. Um, it engages with various town hall style meetings, talks, brainstorming sessions with academic and field experts and designing public centered programming and the Lugo Biennale. Um, what you see next are in no particular order but thematically um, uh, arranged. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Deco Lahore was a very short-lived project, but a very significant one, where we were trying to create a two-way dialogue with our audience. Other than the spectacular images that you see on your screen right now, um, the one significant learning for this project for me was 
that these photographs are not perhaps the climax of the moment, but of an event, but of the transition quality of the moment. So in other words, not your Instagram pictures, but a lived reality of everyday life mundane. So this is what we received as a response from asking our audience to share what they, how they saw the city. Um, this project was very important as it helped us shape what was yet to come, our belief to work with publics by forming, by, by not sitting in the offices, but working in collaboration in larger communities and smaller communities, but responding to the locale and working with um, creative practitioners and academics and the people on ground who actually use and um, are, are the stakeholders of these spaces. Next, please. So um, in light of uh, creating to understand uh, the stakeholders, the public and um, the private and the government, um, we designed this uh, project uh, with the government um, where the bus stops. This was a direct, this project was in direct response to the mass transit line that the government has started and ignoring the already preset, um, you know, um, more, hum uh, more human centered um, public transport. Um, we wanted to create these um, uh, bus stops where there were none. Uh, so learning from um, learning and looking at the procedures and trying to understand how, how one can work in public space, um, we had uh, commissioned an open call and invited seven designers for seven routes um, and a two week rigorous public design engineering uh, philosophy workshops was conducted with them. There were all kinds of learnings here. There was, this was a functional project and we were a young organization and all kinds of pre-planning did not prepare us for the on-ground realities of the project. The government support was essential. And uh, we got that, which, which was, um, um, you know, which, which was very welcome. 72 bus stops later, seven routes, and almost a year later, the project started to become visible. The government's ownership solidified and the higher excitement um, prevailed in them. And then they started to actually change the designs. As you can see, the top one was what was made. The top left was what was designed by the artist. And the one on the right, you know, the government became very excited and started bringing in the, the golden and the, you know, embellishing it with various things. And towards the bottom left, you know, all kinds of commercialism and commodification of, of the bus stops started happening and they started disappearing. What the project did for people was the idea of ownership, safety, service, something purely for them. The users did not care about the ads or changing of the design. They were never for them. Needless to say, there were all kinds of learnings of this project. We found it hard to fight commercialism and commodification and the desire of spectacle. So we knew we had to take a break from such projects and come back to them later at a different time. Um, can we move to the next project? Thank you. Um, what you see over here is the Dial Singh Mansion uh, building. We invited the Mir Hassan Farida Batul uh, Memory Legacy Migration Lahore Ki uh, This uh, particular site is on the Mall Road. Once an iconic restaurant burned down in an era where extremists thought the intolerance, extremists thought an intolerance began to exhibit city power. The mission for the project was very simple. We wanted to reopen the doors of this place through art and invite people back in. The project moved through shared experiences of loss and erasure, healing and repair. We were inundated with stories, people meeting each other after years, talking about, um, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Talking about the dynamism of the site and the idea of hope through its new connectivity. The project was also a critique on co-creation, um, relationship between 
the artists and the people who helped them realize the, uh, the work form forms of art and patronage. Um, our focus for our focus was always on the organic nature of the research and the site, both physical and its embedded knowledge. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, the next one. Another site not so far from the Altsing is the Bhakti House. Um, another place that has been a site of inquiry for LBF since 2018, the Bhakti House once a place of resistance, birthplace of various important movements and shifts, um, which were important to not, not only Lahore but the larger region, was over the years, uh, this place had been lost to neglect and time. Uh, not that the owners were unfamiliar of the history of the place, but their complacency was reduced, had reduced the site just as a tea house. Can we move to the next site, please? We are not looking, we are not looking at any specific desired outcome, just trying to work with the response of the city, of the site, and develop the appetite in the people to look into such projects um, uh, favorably, uh, such spaces favorably, and to engage with them and to bring them back into the consciousness. I'm also very cognizant of the foundation's role by working directly with the city and its authorities and being exposed to all the elements of development and gentrification that comes with it. We are trying to build a model that inversely works with such directions set by people who live and work and are affected by this change. The next one, please. Um, what is lovely about this site is that these uh, this chaiwala sitting outside the chai uh, the chai khana is actually far more aware of the legacy and the importance of this site. So what we're doing is for the next final, we bring this in the the the, the site um, outside uh, into the public realm and uh, with the much beloved um, you know Sunday book market that happens in this particular place. Uh, please, next, please. There is, there is no, it, it is no news for our friends in India, especially Delhi, that last some years have been very challenging due to smog, the climate related issues. Uh, we have also been trying to study and work with experts to understand the actionable points. A forestation law group was formed with the government, academics, and civil society members to share knowledge and response to the local realities. Together with this group, since we have uh, studied a list of indigenous species, uh, encourage the government to plant mostly those, only those, uh, develop a peri-urban um, policy passed laws through the judicial systems, got single-use plastic banned in Lahore, planted about 2.5 million trees within the city, um, and worked on various projects focusing on the health of the city. The goal was, again, very simple, to place ourselves with experts and academics and gov government and understand the ground realities and create a program in response to it. Uh, next slide, please. The Greed School Certification Program, a climate action program, um, please ignore the name because it um, Green School Certification Program sounds, it's, it's mostly to attract um, uh, the attention to the program uh, by the stakeholders and um, the city. Um, it is designed to bring climate education and ecological practices to the younger generation based on the whole systems approach so a sense of awareness and empowerment can be nurtured. It is a complex project at this time. And we have, uh, you know, um, uh, can you move to the next slide, please? 
this is the afforestation uh, project, and we planted about um, you know 2.5 million trees, 53 Miyawaki forests. It was a project that we started the first one, and the government got really excited and planted 53 Miyawaki forests after that. Uh, next one, please. This is the Green Schools uh, project where we bring climate education and ecological practices into schools. And the idea is to uh, work with the next generation to see how we can actually take the new next forward steps. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next, please. This is from there as well. And um, we work with all kinds of indigenous forms. Um, I think the coming biennial working title, Urban Ecologies and Sustainable Futures, is a response of the last six years of investment in this area. And John Tain, curating at the edition, was looking at uh, various forms of practices within the city as form of sustainable um, culture and as a form of onward movement and to learn from new knowledge, new and old knowledge based systems to create a space for the arts to become part of the public discourse. Uh, next, please. Okay. Thank you. So, this is um, can we move ahead? These are some of the projects where the foundation has. Um, next, please. We'll just move to the last slide. So here, um, as a as a creative archives project, virtual museum was inversely looking at the process of creating archives, creating content, not only this time for um, uh, the in person conversations, but to look at um, you know, the virtual space as a place of discourse and, and connection. The next uh, project piece. It was, um, it's an online repository designed specially to um, repurp repurpose, to, uh, to respond to the visual space. We invited six academics and cultural practitioners to respond to content creation keeping in mind the nature of the archiving and demonstrating information, which otherwise would be uh, difficult through in-person exhibition. And once the project was completed, we designed a physical exhibition in response to it that you see. The idea was to continue the project to see how it shapes uh, with time. So there will be further uh, repositories in it. The method of engagement for any project is crit critical. The foundation operates with, with decentralizing approach and is open to new systems of engagement, experimentation, inquiry. Our philosophy is to build consistency of engagement, stay relevant, inspire curiosity, create thinking and collective learning by mobility of artists through commission works, research grants, workshops and talks. Youth and academic engagement is a very important part of the foundation to create a democratic space for the arts as part of a public discourse. And I think this last last slide is very, very important because um, Lahore is a vibrant place and there are all kinds of actors working on it, in it, uh, trying to create a space for the arts and um, engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Kutsia, for that beautiful and thought-provoking presentation. We will now invite the panelists to join us on stage for the panel discussion. This is okay. So,
Okay. Well, um, I was really struck by a lot of interesting ways in which all your presentations. Uh, Kutsia, can you hear me as well? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, all your presentations were drawing so many threads together. One I thought was the emphasis in stories and community engagement in various ways. And all of you can perhaps uh, reflect on questions that you have as audience members as well uh, while we start off our discussion. And you also, um, our presenters thought very hard about how to bring about interdisciplinary knowledges. And Kaiwan, you made that great point in terms of you know, what really counts as interdisciplinary knowledges and how do we kind of bring them to publics. Negotiations with the state and its institutions were very key, uh, especially in the last presentation we heard from Kutsia. And perhaps that also goes along with one of the panels in the conference on patronage uh, and architecture's relationship to the same. And then I also thought a little bit about the formats of making and displaying that was seen as key here. So, you know, I have um, specific questions for each of our panelists, but then uh, our audience is also invited to keep thinking and reflecting on questions as I pose a few questions to them. And maybe we can get started with my question and you can respond to the same. And then in the meantime, we can see who else on Zoom and in person has questions. So Kaiwan, for you, I thought um, you were talking so well about this notion of uh, a cabinet of ideas and almost putting together these ideas in various formats in the print media. And here I'm thinking a little bit about the longer history of such efforts in the Indian subcontinent via magazines like journals like Marg in Design, for instance, which I know were also part of the State of Architecture exhibition in 2016 uh, at NGMA. So I was thinking if you could reflect a bit on how the work that you do in Domus or in other venues is related to uh, or not, or is doing something different from the kind of work that was in Marg or design in the uh, early to mid 20th century as well. So that's one thought that I have. Um, maybe we can start with that and I can. Sure. So I think uh, what is important, there are formal forums like this, but I think all of us work within cultures of relationship. And I think Bombay has given us that beautifully. Delhi has parallel experiences. One very often hears it from colleagues at Delhi. But I think uh, being colleagues and as colleagues, very often you're friends with others who have been editors, uh, an advisor and, and a friend. She's been an editor with Mark. There have been others who've sort of looked at these histories. And so conversations are always there in many informal settings, etc., where one is exchanging notes across time. Uh, so to speak. Having said that, I think in all our positions, there is a required sense somewhere that where are you coming from in the job that you are doing? Who has done this job? How did they do it? Uh, I think that that appears again and again more as a learning learning question. And also you look up to certain models. So no doubt, uh, Marg or design would be a would be a model to look at. Uh, there may be other models which you do not subscribe to, but they have valuable things to give in their own way. So you also are paying attention to to those. So I think in in that sense, it just becomes part of your job that you're attentive to what's happening parallel and what's the history that you come down from. That's, I think, necessary for us to keep alive too. And I think uh, whether it is institutions, whether it is individuals, you do make an effort to build a relationship, go see, etc. Yeah. Is that the range you were asking in? Yeah. I, 
part of part of the interest that I had in learning more about this from you was because uh, those magazines too, I mean, Marx still in existence, uh, design no longer in existence, were conceived as almost cabinets of ideas, bringing together various kinds of arts, crafts, traditional, modern within their pages. And that reminded me of the cover that you talked about, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that you don't just want a brick building mm -hmm. or some sort of a formal manifesto on the cover, but you do want other forms yeah. of yes. um, the arts yeah. on there as well. And I think we've also been conscious of it. I think whether it's been the Kalagoda Arts Festival, whether it's been the conferences that we did with State of Architecture, you mentioned the whole section that we did. Uh, you know, State of Architecture was in three levels. The beginning level was the state of the profession where publication history was something that we looked at very, very consciously. But I think in the in the general, uh, what can I say, the publishing intellectual circuit, I think there has been a consciousness. And one has had many discussions and sessions on what these things meant and their own historical, uh, own historical phases, which is why I think one of the things we did during the State of Architecture exhibition is uh, we had a friend editor who actually worked on the Marg archives and pulled out a series of articles throughout its history that particularly focused on 20th century yeah. architecture and brought them together. And then to say, what does this, what does this mean? So I think there is a, there is a, there is a strong consciousness that you belong to uh, a circuit of ideas and, and collegiality amongst friends and people across historical time, even if they are dead in a certain way, and obviously peer groups. Yeah. So sharing is very, very important here. Yeah. yeah. So all the presentations, something that struck me and very mm -hmm. fascinating was uh, the way each of the practices have kind of um, kind of evolved, where uh, each one of you is wearing multiple hats, sometimes as a curator, sometimes as a researcher, sometimes as just an observer of the city, you know, citizen of the city, but also how each of the practices is very multi-institutional. Like you're working collaboratively with institutions that are not just private trusts or public trusts or um, even with the state or with the government or for the people. Um, so something that I think that I found very fascinating is how do you then engage with projects? You know, some projects, of course, come uh, with a brief, but then how do you reinterpret the brief? Because I know with the UK one uh, for Shifting City as well as for Bohas, it was a reading that came from a very Western idea of understanding the context of where they were talking about, and it needed a reinterpretation of the brief. But also, I mean, in the work of Kutsia, it's a lot of organic work. I mean, what you're observing in the city, you know, whether it is just observing uh, how that little, uh, you know, tea seller fits into that park tea house where he understands the, the railing much better than uh, anyone else, you know. Otherwise, tea shop people, they just put a chapri, they will, there's disregard for where he is. But actually observing that and... Uh, being conscious that the public is doing that and you need to take into account that I found is very interesting or even, um, you know, the Park Tea House, which probably was a very active uh, political center at a certain time. So when you reinterpret a space like that or you kind of readapt that space, how do you make sure that you're still sensitive to what the perception of that place is for the public? So I'm just wondering, actually, it's a question for everyone here, but more so for Kutsia, that how do you then really engage with this these more organic projects? I mean, how do they come to you? Because one is you observe them and you want to do something about it. But how do they really play out in the sphere of actually making it possible and also including the people such that it is still a democratic space that uh, works for the public? Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so, so I am from Lahore. I think that's perhaps my biggest advantage. And it was very well said that uh, it's your relationships and uh, your constitution that brings you on into your work. Um, I have been visiting the Park Tea House since I was a student at NCA. 
And since 2018, we have been working um, on and off in that site. So all various layers of engagement um, uh, within this site, uh, lots of big and small projects. It has been a site for us for the last couple of biennials as well. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, the idea is to go slow. I think that's my process. My process is to go slow. Uh, listen to the people on ground. Visit the site 10 million times um, in different times of the day, in different uh, circumstances. And how does the situation, the location, reacts to different forms of stress at different times? I think you will automatically start finding those players that are active and those players they are that are um, uh, th that bring humanity in that place or bring the culture of that place alive. So I think there's a, a lot of studying, um, observing, asking questions. What do they want? The Jaiwala um, has a certain relationship mm -hmm. to the site far more stronger than the than the party uh, house uh, party house owner. And then trying to negotiate. I think that's another beautiful word that you use, negotiate. I think half of our, my life, um, I revolve around negotiating spaces, negotiating um, uh, space for the arts, um, with the government, with the various stakeholders. Um, and then I think the, your research presents itself and you just have to follow and be true to the research. Um, that that's perhaps my my way of approaching. Thank you. Yeah, Ila, I think uh, two things that sh one is that I think all of us are living this on a daily basis. So it is not really hunting for a project, or you begin thinking when a project uh, comes across or you see it coming coming to you. So in a sense, I think. Uh, you are a political persona. You are a citizen in a city that is living in a particular day every day. And you respond to all of that in your in your work. And I think that's the most crucial, that's the most crucial aspect that the everyday life and the professional life, they have their own protocols, but they are part of one you that is that is there. So I think. Uh, whether, for example, the two two uh, instances that you quoted, whether it was the Bauhaus exhibition, because one is constantly thinking of design histories in India and the fact that there is no uh, decent good book on the history of design in India. And you're constantly working with that. As an editor, you're thinking of that. As an academic, you're thinking of that. And when an opportunity like the Bauhaus 100 Years exa exhibition to do an India pavilion came across, all of that sort of rushes out from 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 somewhere, and I think the same thing happened with uh, with shifting city. Uh, that you had a sense and a, and a pulse that you know. In fact, all of us who are involved have been very invested in South Bombay, but this was a project we had to at least notionally locate in another part of the city and respond respond to it. And it's it's true that. Our projects, I, the other beautiful thing that Kutsi has said, and which I relate to very much, very often, even with Alison Buleshwar, I say that after a time, the project dictates what you what you do because it takes a life of its own, and you work through that. Through that, yeah. Yeah, and um, I think there's one other layer uh, that of representation, you know that happens in a certain stage after we have researched, we have found the critical elements, then, then there's this uh, question of representation, which might take you some distance away from what you had initially uh, planned or thought about your project. I think that's an interesting process in the uh, in exhibition making, in, in producing books. So that's, a, that's an additional layer, yes. Sorry. For all our Zoom participants, you can leave your questions in chat. We'll circle back to you, but just leave it in chat so we can do that in the end. But Roshan, you wanted to add, sorry. I just, oh, I just wanted to add a bit. Uh, I'm just thinking about the space uh, at the Tarago next. And uh, when you talk about this relationship, I always feel that the bricks of Tarago speaks with me more than it, with Kalpusha. And that's a different relationship, you know. And I think, you know, the way Kalpusha would 
define that relationship with the Brit will be completely different than the way I define it. And that also kind of starts making me think about, you know, like when you mentioned about the tea shop, I, I, you know, on my way to work, I look at this tea shop, which is under a, under an electric pole, which is which has got just wires, you know, and it's a chaos. But we also need to understand that within the within that chaos, we have a sense of order as well, you know, and that order we the neighborhood can understand. You know, every single house around that street has got the electricity. Every single house around that street has got the Wi-Fi. So there is a sense of order, right? And I think we as a curator, you know, we when we when we deal with these sort of projects, I think there is a different narration that comes through. When you when you look at, you know, from from a from a practitioner point of view, and when you look at it from a from a very public point of view, there are two different narrations. And I, I think we need to try to bring that together and find a common path. And that is that is very important for us, I think. Just to that, uh, Ila, okay. I have one, uh, sorry. Can I just make one uh, other yes, comment? Yes, please, please. Um, I think uh, there is just one other element, which is leaving room for failure. I think uh, we actually put ourselves in a lot of stress. Uh, while doing these public projects, and it's okay to fail. It's okay to 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 take a hit and to say you've made a you know a wrong decision, um, but then to 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 reengage uh, through its learnings. That's all I wanted to say. Roshan, just because you were talking about you know uh, you're talking about the narratives of the public and what you perceive as a curator. I was wondering, you know, especially because the Nepal Architecture Archives and Taragao Museum, not only does it host the archives, but it itself is a heritage building that you've restored. But, you know, often uh, what happens when you engage with public to you simplify stuff, right? You simplify the understanding of heritage and often, you know, it becomes more fetishized for the public than uh, the way we'd want them to perceive it. And when that happens, a lot of these embedded histories or embedded narratives or understanding of, say, the Taragao Museum, the structure itself here, right. gets lost. So how do you kind of engage with someone who may not be um, very aware or understand these um, hidden cultural um, artifacts in some way? And um, how do you ensure they don't get lost but are also explained in a more simplified way that they don't um, become fetishizes, mm -hmm. fetishizing, mm -hmm. but actually are valued for its, uh, you know, for its cultural history. Yeah. The Tarago Museum, that building is, you know, one of the very first contemporary building built after after 50s. Uh, the first project he did was within the, within the uh, Trivian University uh, premises. And every time, you know, when I look at the Tarragon building itself and when the viewers and the, and the public, they interact with the building, I think, you know, one of my, one of my struggle within that space is, as I, as I mentioned in my presentation as well, you know, the building itself is a Mona Lisa, you know, and uh, how do I, get my viewers, get my audience inside the building because they're so much overwhelmed by the architecture itself. And they connect with that building in various different ways. You know, some of the, some of the elements I showed you like the water spout and other things, right? People relate that, people relate that. And they also kind of understand that that is the very unique building that is within Kathmandu. They don't need to know the history of that building, but they have that understanding that this building has become a valuable space for the public. You know, not only as a museum, not only as a green space, not only as an architectural space, right? But this understanding is, you know, initially I think that understanding is good enough for me to kind of, you know, be in that situation where my audience are, how they're interacting with that space, right? And uh, 
And, uh, you know, the, the history part, the, the importance part, the heritage part, it's all written, you know, you can, you can find it around the building, you can find it in infographics, it, it is telling it, you know, screaming all in, on, the, on the building, right? So I don't really need to kind of focus in that part. I think the most important part is, I think what people have realized is we're losing this sort of a space where you have got a blend with architecture, open space and a green space, right? I, I live in almost, you know, the, the museum itself is in the center of city. And when I think about similar space around that area, there is not, there are none, right? So how, how you know, people, people want to engage in that sort of space. And I think when they come to that space, they automatically start speaking with the architecture. They automatically start thinking about the architecture and then they think about its history, the present context, and everything that happens around it. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to solicit questions from the audience. So one here, then one here, and one in the middle. Well, that's, that's great, yeah. Hi, my, I'm Pratush. I'm Professor of Architecture, thanks all of you for a wonderful presentation. My uh, comment is directed towards Roshan, since I'm so familiar and such a fan of Nepal, Kathmandu Valley. Um, you know, I mean, there is this, uh, this burden of heritage. I think she was also, in some sense, hinting at that, uh, especially when we look at the, the history or the lineage of heritage research, you know, the whole... Uh, European scholars coming in 40s and 50s and also modern architects. So that's that's one line of thought that exists in, in Kathmandu and Nepal. But also what I find fascinating, and I think that's what you're trying to get at, is the way public places, open spaces are used in Nepal. In fact, the fact that uh, Kanak was so fearless perhaps has to do with how public open spaces have kind of you know, germinated a messy urbanism or the democratic protest cultures in Nepal, which is fascinating. Not many people talk about that. In fact, that's the seems to be the last living hope. But the way contemporary cosmopolitanness has evolved in Nepal is actually, I feel, can be also contributed to the idea of public open spaces in a very contemporary fashion. And I'm very curious, you know, when you said you're looking at Taragaon next, and that, to my mind, is a very fascinating idea because perhaps uh, the gaze can be and should move away only from heritage. And I mean, we have uh, uh, people from Kathmandu Value Preservation Trust, they're all friends. But then what are your thoughts there? I mean, are you also looking at the city as, as, as a way or you look at Karl Prusha's work as also almost like a microcosm of the contemporary uh, you know, city. So that's a very fascinating idea of space that I find emerging in the way you're describing very eloquently Taragao Museum. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the next component, but the way we have to see is like when you, when you talked about the open space, you know, it's, it has become so important factor for us, right? So if you, you have been to Patan, right? You, you go, when you go to Patan Darbar Square, that doesn't mean that you'll go to Patan Museum. That doesn't mean that, you know, you, you, you're just going to go and see the exhibits. You might be meeting a friend. You might be having a cup of tea. You might just want to enjoy the open space and interact with the public, right? So the, the idea of Taragao Next is similar. So when you think about Patan Darbar Square, the Taragao Next is also a name of a space, not the name of the building, right? So within Taragao Next, we have got multiple things happening. There is a contemporary art gallery. There is a museum. There is open amphitheater. You know, there is a cafe and green space, right? So all these factors are within that Taragao next. So we have actually coined that name as a name for the space, and that is that is very important. And one of the reason we stopped calling Taragao museum is I think the museum word itself is becoming very very colonial. Right, and we want to kind of move away from that. When you say Taragao next, and there is a space within that, that makes a completely different, different, you know, sense. And I think we wanted to kind of move into that 
idea of inviting people by not just saying a museum, it becomes a very difficult space when you talk about a museum. The local public might not be able to enter easily within that space. But if you think about Patandarva Square, they don't even need to think about you know, uh, a museum. They can just go there and chill out and enjoy the space. So I think the whole idea is to see the space in a completely different year, in the level. It's a multi-layered space. And I, I just wish that, you know, like Kanak, Kanak Sai yesterday mentioned about the Parliament House. It is, it is, it is, you know, it is taking so much space and it is within the four walls. I just wish it was an accessible space for the public. So how can we actually create spaces like Taragon next? You know, and that is a big concern. I think there are so many buildings which are empty. There's so many buildings that needs renovation, restoration, and repurposed. Right, and I think this is this could be a very starting point of how we see our Baha Bahis monastery spaces, you know, courtyards, and convert that into a very cultural space. Not necessarily always as a as a bed and breakfast, you know. That is that is probably that is also one of the way to preserve the space. But how much we need that? I think we need to convert, repurpose these spaces into a completely different way. And I think that's how what Taragon Next is doing at the moment. Um, <laughs> my question is for Kaiwan, as someone who's writing and researching and curating in English, what is your concept of community? Uh, that you talk about in your work. And um, a second question is about the role of design in your exhibitions and in Domus particularly. Um, what is the sense of design? Is there a singular approach with which you engage with the concept of designing both the publication and your exhibitions? Yeah, first question. Yeah. I have a question. So I'm curious about how all this is structured. And perhaps the success of this lies in the autonomy of whatever you do, you know, how how you do and state is from the government. How they how is this funded? How does it actually work? And I'm thinking of how private organizations, businesses have skewed the structure of these places. Uh, so uh, I'd be curious to hear. Right. So. Hi, I'm Sunaina. I have a young practice, architectural practice in Chennai. My question specifically is to Roshan, but also uh, the wider panel in general. Um, you, uh, with the Talagao Museum, you did, you know, not the museum, but Talagao Next, you did uh, show us this beautiful archive that you've collected. And I just wanted to understand a little bit more about the actual process and how do you go about um, researching and collecting these various uh, things which may belong to private or public individuals, were there any challenges that you faced? And uh, how does, as a private individual or as an architect, young architect, how do you embark on this process and how do you navigate it? Let's take one more. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Snehanshu Mukherjee, and uh, my question is really directed to the three cities Dhaka, Kathmandu, and uh, Dahor. Uh, I realize that uh, both uh, Kathmandu and uh, Dhaka have centers where you attract people in. But in the case of Lahore, I didn't see a center or any discussion about any specific centers. Now, my question really is that if these organizations are doing things for the people of that city or the country, then how do you get people into the center? That's how I found the Lahore uh, example rather interesting that they don't bother too much. I, I may be totally wrong, so Kutsia, please correct me if that is the case that uh, you are there out on the streets. And in the case of uh, Dhaka as well, 30,000 people coming to a classical concert 
uh, beats even Dover Lane in Calcutta. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> I just want to know this. That's my question. Um, Rajni from Bhutan, and I, I live and work in Bhutan, but I'm not Bhutanese. Uh, I, my question was to the Nepal, the Karl Prusha Center. Uh, is it open to collaborating with uh, places in, in around in the region? For example, if a Bhutanese, could you be linked with that? Would you do host something or allow them a space there? And I suppose the same goes to Bangladesh and uh, uh, Lahore too, or Mumbai in Kaiwan's case. Thank you. Take one last question. Can anything on Zoom? One question, so if you can read it out. And then you've got about five or seven. Hello. Uh, my name is, uh, I'm Dr. Ojit, teaching geology in the University of Delhi. Uh, thanks for a very interdisciplinary uh, discussion. My question is to uh, Kaiwan. Uh, I hope you show one pictures of the anatomy of insects in your talk. Uh, there was a slide. So I just want to know how that particular, you know, the daily experience bringing the indiscernible to this particular platform. I, I, I really am crazy to uh, <laughs> review that particular slides. Thank you so much. Sahana so Ali says all these presentations were very interesting, but my question is, how do you engage local communities to attend all these exhibitions? Because in these kind of exhibitions, mostly the elite come. And what are your views on other initiatives like the Karachi Biennale? Okay, rapid fire now. <laughs> yeah, so to quickly to the English question, I think one has to be flexible working across languages in different ways. So if I'm working in Bombay, I'm very familiar with uh, Gujarati, Hindi, Marathi. So I can do work, research, reading. In, in fact, for PhD, it's considered ethical that you work in the languages that you're, the region you're working in. And then I think in English and English is my language. I have no qualms about that. So English is as my language, as much as Gujarati is. And Alison Buleshwar has been translated in Hungarian and my essays have been translated in German. And we sort of correspond as to how the language catches the nuances of the essays or the text. So I think one has one works flexible across, uh, across languages. The design question, especially for Dobus, the design direction, when you work in a franchisee, it comes from Milan. And it depends on what's the philosophy they are following. So when they were doing these guest editors every year, like Tadawando, et cetera, they put a design idea and then we sort of followed it uh, up. But I did have the liberty to tweak it and play it around in terms of, for me, always the question was how to play between text and image, because I insisted on longish text. If people don't want, if people are lazy in reading, nobody reads, everybody tells me that, that's their problem, not my problem. I'm a writer, I will write. You are a reader, you want to read or not read is your problem, that kind of a thing. I'll also go in this context to the community, uh, local communities question. I think we, at, at least in my case, we've oscillated between different kinds of crowds. One of the reasons I think uh, one has insisted along with other colleagues and friends participated or been curators at the Kalagora Arts Festival is because you draw audiences from across the city in thousands and thousands. But if you're at a conference like this, we are talking a language, we are talking that is going to be accessible to a, to a crowd of a certain nature. So I think we also accept that at times we make effort to reach out to different audiences. If you have a conference in a school, you're getting across to a different audience altogether. So I think that's another thing that rather than having very stiff thing that, oh, we have to reach out, we have to reach out, you reach out as and when the occasion uh, occasion arises. If I'm not mistaken, that is a work of an artist who actually makes these uh, very craft, uh, because I have been sort of uh, working or interestingly looking at a lot of artists who work with nature and ecology, because I, uh, and I got into this because I, I curated an exhibition on the idea of the zoo. And that brought me much more closer to this interest in nature 
and how we how so and, and then artists who worked with nature so that's where it must have creeped in from thank you okay I'll just uh, uh, address about the Nepal Architecture Archive and how the collection is actually happening there. Uh, the collection actually happens from two different modes. One is actually a donation and the other one is actually actual acquisition that happens through the foundation. And the idea is to kind of collect the materials. When I say materials, scholarly materials that is written about Nepal, Nepali heritage, culture and tradition doesn't matter it needs to be 20 years old it can be just yesterday's work right so if it makes sense to us in that way then that becomes a part of the collection and the, this collection one of my main tasks is to kind of connect with these scholars and individuals who lived in Kathmandu for many many years you know i con you know continuously connect with them and then find out how they can actually uh, support the archive because you know, all these individuals, they live for so long in Kathmandu, they, they come to an age and they go back to their country and they don't have a custodian for their materials. So we are the right custodians to safe keep those materials. And that's how we grow our collection. And we have got just under 100 individuals and scholars who have actually contributed uh, to the Nepal Architecture Archive. So that's that's the kind of a general idea how we how we collect. And uh, just regarding uh, the collaboration you mentioned, I think we are always open to that collaboration, you know, being, being an institution in Nepal, we just don't want to be visible only in the Nepali community. We want to be global as well and talk about what we do, you know? And I think that is the only way that we can do that is through collaborations. And we are always open to those sort of ideas. At the moment, we're doing collaboration with Heidelberg University, other foundations, and there's always projects happening. So that will be a very good idea to have some sort of projects from Bhutan. Um, just regarding one more question that came from online, the engagement with the with the public, how we can do that. Uh, with Taragal Museum, I think, you know, it's mostly the local people who are actually coming. We're not sending any invitation or anything. These people who visit the space, you know, the Taragal next space, they will have that ability to go and see different exhibitions, the exhibitions, separate exhibitions, not, you know, the, the, the temporary exhibitions are not charged separately. So they can feel free to go and hang around in exhibitions and understand. And we are always there and we do on a weekly basis, there is a museum too happening, you know, and we talk about these exhibitions that happens within this space. Just a couple of things, uh, talking about vernacular in Bangladesh, it's quite different from India or Pakistan, where we really have to focus on the vernacular and make sure that whatever is published, um, whatever material is published along that comes with exhibitions, catalogs, everything is available in Bengali. It's very important that we do that. Um, how do we get 30,000 people? It's... Um, that's a question I ask myself also, but honestly, it's um, it's got to do with the way the program was structured, um, and I think I should I can't elaborate uh, further here. But uh, um, how do you get people to attend programs? You make that's I think what uh, Roshan said was very important. The architecture is responsible for that. You make sure it's not intimidating. You make sure it's free. You make sure that people come anyways, whether you're having something on or not. If um, And uh, collections, actually, we build organically. We want, we want to collect everything. That's always a problem. But we want to collect everything. And, uh, um, and you have to be patient about collecting. Um, lastly, Mm, no, that was it. That's all I want. Uh, funding. Uh, funding was, I think, gentlemen wanted to know about funding. Uh, we are a private um, arts organization. I think that makes uh, it possible for us to work independently and not uh, be dictated by funders. That's all. Thank you. Um, so, sir, you like to add something? I... Okay. So, go ahead. So, so, for us, it's very simple. We have a mandate that we started with bring art in public spaces. I think that discounts the, the need for a center because we're looking at Lahore as a living laboratory. Um, for us, collaboration is very, very important because we believe that there are all kinds of, like, you know, people out there, experts, academics, you know, sometimes field experts and people on ground, the people we're working with, they, they have embedded knowledge that uh, is important to us. 
So yes, locally, globally, we are, uh, you know, it, we work in collaboration with everyone. Uh, local communities, um, since a project is made for them, designed for them, with their response, uh, in in some uh, concept, they are co-authors of the project, right? So it just is a very natural process of inviting people inside um, uh, into our spaces. Um, and I think a lot of things uh, Kaiwan had also uh, made clear about... Um, yeah which I truly uh, agree. Mm, is there anything left? Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to uh, you know all the panelists. And I'm sure some of these questions we'll carry on uh, discussing. See, I didn't have to say a hand of applause, so that was very good. Uh, and uh, I'm sure some of these questions will carry on. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and we will start at 11.50. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll have one hour of presentations again in a half an hour discussion. So lunch break for anyone who's planning it would be about 1.20. Uh, we are a few minutes behind and we'll make up. So thank you all again. And thanks to all the panelists. And Kirisa, thank you for connecting from Lahore and all thank the you. best. Thank you. Bye. So 10 minutes, we'll be back. Yeah.